Thank you for joining today's webinar, Understanding the CCST Report on Health and Fracking in California. My name is Sue Chang. I'm the Pollution Prevention Director at the Center for Environmental Health. We're delighted to be co-hosting this webinar with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments and the Center for Biological Diversity. A couple of housekeeping notes before we start the presentations. All participants will remain muted for the duration of the webinar due to the large number of people on the online. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to type them into the questions box in the control panel on your screen at any time. You should see a um, panel that says questions and if you hit the plus sign, it'll open up a box. Annie Sarter of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments will be collecting the questions, which we'll address after we've heard from both speakers. If you're experiencing any technical problems, please type in a message in the chat box on the control panel and send it to the organizers. We are recording this webinar and we'll notify everyone who signed up when it's available. With that, I'd like to move into the main part of our webinar. We have two presenters who will speak for about up to 20 minutes each with the last 20 minutes reserved for questions and answers. Our first presenter is Holland Kretzman, who is a staff attorney for the Center for Biological Diversity. His focus is on oil and gas issues in California. Prior to joining the center, Holland worked for the Clean Air Council in Pennsylvania, working on air pollution issues caused by fracking. He holds a JD degree from the University of Chicago Law School. Holland will give an overview of the CCST report and highlight the most important findings and what it means for fracking and oil development in California. Our second presenter is Barbara Sattler, who's a professor in public health at the University of San Francisco. She has been an advisor to the EPA's Office of Child Health Protection and the National Library of Medicine for informational needs of health professionals on environmental health. She's a founding member of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, an international organization that is helping to integrate environmental health into nursing education, practice, research, and policy. She's the author of Environmental Health and Nursing and a host of peer-reviewed articles. Barbara will offer an analysis of the report from a public health perspective. With that, I will now turn the controls over to Holland. Okay. All right, Holland, you should be able to show your uh, screen. Yes, you can hear me, Sue? Yes. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, Sue said uh, I will be walking through some of the um, points of the independent scientific study that uh, came in July that um, looked into the environmental and health impacts of uh, fracking and other types of well stimulation. Uh, I'm going to refer to it as fracking uh, as a shorthand for this, uh, the purposes of this presentation, but um, uh, well stimulation in California does include uh, acidization, which is uh, another form of stimulating a well and uh, increasing the flow of oil to the surface, but we'll just go with fracking for today's purposes. Um, before I get into the study, I'd like to cover the context of how the study came about, which is, I think, important. Uh, um, so a couple years ago, as Californians found out that fracking here in our state, and given the dangers that we witnessed in other states where fracking had taken off, uh, there was a lot of support for a moratorium in California to put the brakes on fracking before it took off here. Uh, Senate Bill 4 started out as a moratorium when it was first drafted, uh, but at the last minute the bill was gutted by the oil industry and allowed fracking to move forward unabated. One of the few things that was salvaged was a scientific study. And the California Council on Science and Technology um, took the lead on that and what we got was an independent uh, scientific panel that in theory would come up with this report and help inform our 
policymakers on how to address fracking going forward. Uh, unfortunately, the results of the study were delayed and weren't published in time to uh, help guide the regulations on fracking. Uh, it wasn't in time to guide the statewide environmental impact report, um, which the uh, Division of Oil and Gas put together to outline the environmental uh, and health risks of uh, fracking. Governor Brown at the time uh, told us to give science a chance um, and the environmental and public health communities were for two years while this uh, study was put together. Um, in, in the meantime, in New York, uh, health professionals looked at the existing science on fracking and came to the conclusion that the risks were too great to the public and ended up banning the practice. Uh, so in California we were told to wait, uh, but the science is now in and uh, unfortunately it confirms our concerns with fracking in that it presents a substantial threat to our water, our air, and our health. Uh, so I'll go over some of the findings from the report today. These are the main areas that we'll cover. Uh, are the risk to groundwater and surface water. Uh, air pollution, human health, which I'll just go over briefly because I know Barbara will go into that in more detail, and briefly on earthquakes as well. Uh, before I get into it further, uh, it's important to remember that even though this report and this presentation are focused on fracking, uh, one of the key findings of the CCST report was that many of these risks apply to all oil and gas activity. Now, fracking is just one of the many stages in oil and gas development. You also have to construct the site, uh, drill the well, clean and maintain the well, uh, produce the oil and gas, dispose of the wastewater. Uh, each of these stages uh, makes use of toxic chemicals, comes with the risks of spills and accidents, and even without those present uh, substantial environmental and health risks. Uh, so the worst harms from fracking uh, may be indirect, and the, the study points this out, that in other words, the ability of fracking to enable uh, oil and gas acti activity to proliferate and prolong the life of uh, active wells uh, may be the biggest threat that it poses. But we'll take uh, fracking and its uh, threats to water first. So uh, water, uh, is particularly uh, at risk in California uh, because of the way fracking is conducted here. Uh, in other states, uh, there's a lot of distance between where fracking happens and where the groundwater occurs beneath us. Um, and yet there's still a very uh, big risk that uh, contaminants will migrate towards those groundwater resources. Here in California, the risk is uh, that much greater because as fracking takes place at very shallow depths, 75% uh, of um, fracking events occur uh, 2,000 feet of the surface. And that puts it within close proximity to groundwater, and often it's at the exact same depths at the groundwater. Uh, and so given this proximity, the study said that this could potentially form uh, direct transport pathway to groundwater. Uh, it also noted that in California, uh, where we do have a, a long history of oil and gas development, there are older wells nearby that may have been abandoned and forgotten about, and these can uh, become conduits for contaminants for when there's a newer well drilled nearby. Uh, and then finally, uh, the faults that occur naturally in California, both those that are known and unknown um, can also uh, act as pathways for contaminants to, to reach groundwater. Um, given these dangers, the CCST made a recommendation that uh, uh, the state deny uh, permits for shallow fracking near groundwater uh, unless it can be shown to be safe. 
Uh, as I said, um, fracking is just one of the many stages in oil and gas development. Uh, one of the major concerns is what happens after fracking. Uh, oil and gas activity in general produces a high amount of wastewater. Uh, CCST called this uh, the highest priority in terms of risks to water. Um, there are a number of ways that uh, oil companies attempt to get rid of wastewater. Uh, unfortunately, none of them uh, is a safe disposal method, and we'll go through these uh, each and um, The first and most popular um, way to get rid of wastewater in California is to use percolation ponds or sumps. Um, basically, this is just a ditch that's dug into the dirt and wastewater is uh, put in there to uh, percolate into the soil beneath it and uh, perhaps into the groundwater. Uh, it also evaporates uh, into the air. Um, this is a, a huge concern because of what's in wastewater. Uh, not only are the fracking chemicals potentially present, um, but even chemicals that occur naturally in the formation that have been brought to the surface uh, could pose a threat to public health and environment. Another uh, method is to use injection wells. Um, the, the, the second most popular way is to inject it into uh, these wells that um, uh, take the wastewater and put it into a formation beneath, uh, beneath the earth. And in some cases, uh, as the state has admitted, we have actually allowed wastewater to enter into what are supposed to be protected aquifers, the groundwater that has uh, high quality water that could be used for drinking or irrigation, uh, instead have been used as dumping grounds for uh, wastewater injection. And finally, uh, irrigation is another alternative, uh, but uh, the CCST report points out that uh, fracking chemicals, uh, the, the treatment processes are unlikely to remove uh, fracking chemicals or their byproducts before the uh, wastewater gets into the irrigation system. So uh, any of these three methods are uh, pretty dangerous and uh, rightly the CCST recommends that uh, unless we can prove them safe and right now they cannot, uh, we should be phasing out percolation ponds and ban the use of uh, fracking wastewater for irrigation. Uh, next we'll move on to air pollution. Um, the the CCST report um, notes that really this, this is an uh, unknown area of the science and um, there are no good uh, studies in California about um, how, how, uh, how emissions from oil and gas sites um, migrate to nearby communities, what those chemicals are, uh, how much of those chemicals um, are creating uh, dangerous levels of exposure. Uh, and so the, the main takeaway from uh, air pollution was that there, there is reason to be concerned because of the number of dangerous chemicals used in fracking and, and other stages of the process, but uh, it's impossible to tell um, how much of it is attributable to fracking. Um, how much of the air pollution is going where. Uh, there are just a lot of question marks um, in terms of air pollution. They did ca categorize or, or catalog, sorry, the uh, chemicals that we know about that are used in fracking. Uh, 14 of those that were used in California were among um, the, the UN's most toxic substances, which gives um, great reason for concern. Uh, besides the chemicals that are used in the actual fracking fluid, uh, there are a number of compounds that are emitted from oil and gas sites that, that include uh, benzene and other BTEX compounds, formaldehyde, as you see other uh, pollutants that have been uh, associated with uh, adverse human health effects. 
other than the known chemicals, there's also the additional concern that we simply don't know um, the full slate of, of chemicals that may be threatening uh, our nearby communities. Uh, 100 of the 300 chemicals used in fracking are still unidentified, uh, including two of the top 20 most commonly used chemicals. Uh, Two-thirds have incomplete information on toxicity, so we simply don't know uh, how severely uh, it would affect uh, someone who's exposed to it. Uh, the same with biodegradability and bioaccumulation. There's a lot of data gaps there. Uh, there are no studies on the byproducts of fracking chemicals, so uh, even if we know the uh, formula of fracking fluid that goes down the well, uh, what comes back up might not be the same after the chemicals have had a chance to react with one another, after they've had a chance to react with the uh, elements in the formation, uh, it could be a different um, byproduct that comes up. And like I said before, the emissions data is uh, very much lacking. The CCST uh, went into the literature and reviewed some of the um, more troubling studies about uh, how communities and families living close to active oil and gas wells have uh, seen an increase in um, health problems uh, ranging from respiratory illnesses to uh, sinus problems, shortness of breath, uh, to um, uh, difficulties for uh, pregnant women and uh, possibly congenital heart defects and neural tube defects uh, for children who are born close to active uh, oil and gas wells. And I'll just cover this briefly because Barbara will go into it a little more, but um, the, the study uh, came to the conclusion that, that many other science panels have reached, uh, which is that the closer residents are to these uh, industrial facilities, the higher their potential exposure to toxic air emissions and the higher risk of associated health effects. Uh, that's a particular concern in California where um, we have higher density populations uh, compared to where some uh, of the other fracking takes place in the country. Uh, the studies indicate that uh, they, they vary in distances that they study, but uh, some of them show that there are significant um, health impacts at 3,000 meters, almost two miles away from an active well. And uh, these are uh, mostly studies of um, active oil and gas wells that don't distinguish between fracked or unfracked wells. So the uh, after reviewing the literature on that, the uh, CCST made the recommendation that we in California should establish science-based setbacks between uh, our homes and our schools and all oil and gas activity, not just the fracked wells, but all oil and gas uh, activity. Um, one of the concerns with fracking has been the uh, potential for it to uh, trigger earthquakes, and we've seen <clears throat> a connection with earthquakes in other parts of the country. Uh, fracking itself has, a, you know, just a few cases shown to directly trigger earthquakes uh, of about 3 to 3.5 magnitude uh, in other um, areas of the continent. Uh, what we've mostly seen in the United States is that the wastewater from oil and gas activities, including fracking, uh, when it's injected into these disposal wells, has caused uh, significant uh, earthquakes uh, in Oklahoma and elsewhere, the largest being a 5.7 earthquake in Oklahoma. Uh, the CCST uh, noted that there are no uh, seismic studies um, that have looked at the relationship between oil and gas activity here in California uh, and uh, seismic activity. Um, but given the uh, history of seismic activity in California and given 
the proximity of where the oil and gas activity occurs, uh, the report says that the risks are at least as high in California. Uh, and they took a look um, just in a couple cases uh, at the data between seismic activity and injection activity in California, and they did find a link between uh, injection well activity and a cluster of earthquakes in the Santa Maria Basin. Uh, so they recommend that earthquakes be studied uh, more in depth to, you know, establish uh, more conclusively um, how strong the link is between uh, injection well activity and seismic activity. So to recap before I turn it over to Barbara, um, fracking in all oil and gas in California is dangerous and the CCST report found that uh, shallow fracking occurs uh, near the groundwater, uh, near active fault lines. In California we allow percolation ponds to uh, that allow oil companies to dump uh, toxic wastewater directly into our soil and into our groundwater. Um, we have a history of older and unmapped wells uh, that heighten the risk of um, enabling chemicals to travel underground uh, and possibly contaminate groundwater. Uh, Fracking enables other dangerous techniques uh, like cyclic steam injection. So I mentioned the, the indirect effects of fracking uh, may actually be uh, uh, as great or a greater concern than the direct effects of fracking. Uh, we have no statewide setbacks uh, here in California and uh, our agencies have admitted that they uh, have not been up to the task of, of protecting our groundwater here. So that those are just some of the reasons that uh, fracking in California is a particular concern. And finally, a recap of the uh, some of the CCST recommendations that uh, I think are, are important um, to deny shallow fracking permits near groundwater, uh, to eliminate the use of percolation ponds for all oil and gas, uh, to stop the practice of uh, allowing fracking chemicals to potentially wind up in irrigation water, uh, establish science-based setback distances uh, to um, create a buffer between homes and schools with uh, oil and gas wells, and uh, further study on uh, a number of areas, including the chemicals used, the toxicity of those chemicals, uh, how much of it ends up in the air, where it goes, uh, links to earthquakes and uh, adverse health impacts. All of these are huge data gaps that need to be addressed. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Barbara. So um, I just wanted to start by explaining that, uh, that the places where we do fracking um, uh, are places where there are shale plays. And you can see in California where there are shale plays, but we're also doing a variety of other kinds of extractions. And so um, as, as with Holland, I'm going to be talking about sort of what the CCST report has said about gas and oil extraction writ large. So the, the, all of the elements of fracking uh, actually have some degree of health risks to them. And I'm going to be trying to sort of tease these out a little bit. Um, and uh, the first one, which is, has been noted in the um, CCST and Holland mentioned, just uh, literally about the amount of water that is needed for the fracking process, water ac acquisition, which is the first piece here. Um, there's a quote in the report that said it could cause concern for domestic users that rely on, on water in the area. And um, it made it sound like that might be something in the future. And I just um, wanted people to know that in the Central Valley right now, there are numbers of people whose wells are already dry. Um, and there's a 90-day there's uh, waiting list right now for people uh, to actually get um, uh, people to come in and, and drill new wells. So there are people who are going to be out of water essentially for up to three months. 
There are also, uh, a if you go to any of the oil fields, gas and oil fields in the Central Valley, um, you'll see that there are a lot of different vehicles that are involved and, and the vehicles themselves are sort of part of the health problem and I'm going to talk a little about that as well. So let's start at the wellhead. Um, there, currently, there currently is an investigation of nine workers' deaths that may be associated with um, some of the chemical exposures that they had in terms of um, chemicals that they were breathing. We also know that silica is, uh, is a, um, like a sand that is used in the fracking process. And in 2012, which is the last year that we had numbers on this, nationally 28 million metric tons were used. Um, and this is uh, silica exposures are seen as carcinogenic. Um, silica is a carcinogen, it can cause lung cancer, and when the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health sampled 11 sites around the country, they found that uh, all of those sites uh, exceeded the permissible exposure level, meaning that they exceeded the levels that were set on by, uh, by NIOSH. Um, and then there was 84% um, of them exceeded if you were to take an eight-hour period and sort of average it out at that level, 84% uh, of them exceeded that. So I mentioned about trucks. A um, couple of things that happen with as many trucks as are introduced to a community that where as fracking is going on. First of all, um, you've got increased truck traffic. The traffic excel itself we know is associated with increased motor vehicle accidents, um, increased uh, degradation of the roads, um, almost all of these trucks use diesel. Um, when uh, diesel is emitted at ground level, it contributes to ground level ozone. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and in many of our rural areas where we're now seeing increased activity around gas and oil ex extraction, um, this is becoming a real problem for the communities. Um, places where they might just have one traffic light now has got congestion that they never experienced before. And uh, all of this, and I'll mention other things, all of these kind of contribute to the overall degradation of the quality of life in the communities where fracking is going on. So one of the things that we know happens is that when um, there are radioactive chemicals in deep in the ground that are perfectly safe there. We don't, um, if they're deep in the ground, we don't have exposures. When they become shallow exposures, which sometimes happens with radon, they can actually get into our basements and, and into, our, into our well water. But when we're fracking and actually going down and extracting um, from uh, deeper in the ground, um, what we found is we also wind up pulling up uh, unintentionally radioactive chemicals like radon and radium and uranium. And now we've brought this up to the surface. So now we, uh, especially if we're putting these in holding ponds, we've now got um, not just chemical waste in those ponds, but mixed radioactive and chemical waste in those ponds. So, um, so as, uh, as has been mentioned, there are several things that can happen to the uh, to the waste, and in all instances, this means that there are worker exposures to the waste uh, and the chemicals. Um, so the first is that they can be put in a lined um, holding pond, but in a recent um, trip that Annie Sartor, uh, Sue Chang, and I went on uh, to the Central Valley, to the areas outside of Bakersfield, we didn't see a single pond that was uh, lined, and in fact, in the CCST report, it notes that 60% of the ponds are unlined, and that means that these um, that these chemicals, this produced water, actually has a really high risk of contaminating the soil there because it's just going to leach right into it. I mean, anything that's not going to be evaporated into the air is going to go down into the soil. So you've got soil contamination as a real risk, and then you've got further risk of, especially if you've got shallow aquifers, which we know we do in California, the risk of those chemicals going down there. And then you're winding up with this in our drinking water. Um, you're also winding up with it for use on our agricultural fields. 
Um, there are permanent storage tanks. We don't see that that much here. The reinjection uh, sites um, Holland talked about. Sometimes they take it off-site and reinject it elsewhere. And, um, and the whole thing uh, to note about this is that these activities, including the new reinjection sites, are often in communities that are, have already uh, been plagued with a variety of environmental impacts, and now we're just adding to them. The other thing that um, happens is illegal dumping of the waste. And in one of the places where we went uh, in Bakers, the Bakersfield area, we saw how they were. Um, there was a mechanism for them to extract from the ponds, and then they put that fluid into the trucks and they spray the ground in order to keep the dust down. So they're spraying around the whole neighborhood essentially. So the other thing that happens with these quote unquote holding ponds, um, and this happens more often back east right now, is that when they have a severe rain, the areas can get flooded and they wind up holding nothing. Um, we've got El Nino predictions for this year. Uh, and that's probably going to start happening in the next few months. So in those places where we've got these holding ponds, where we are likely to see flooding over this winter, um, we'll have um, holding ponds that hold nothing there as well. So the, in terms of toxic chemicals, um, I thought it, the language was very interesting in the report. It said only a few are highly toxic. Well, that is really, from a public health perspective, that's not uh, particularly um, comforting. And many of them are, and these are quotes, are moderately toxic. As Holland told you, a third of them have never been tested. So we can't assume that those third, that third of those chemicals, meaning about a hundred of them that have not been tested, are not toxic. We know that when volatile organic chemicals, and for those who don't know what a volatile, volatile organic chemical is, that's a chemical that at room temperature will start to evaporate into the air. And room temperature is thought to be around 70 degrees. So when you get into the Central Valley or elsewhere, where your temperatures start to rise 100 plus, you wind up, you wind up having uh, increased risk of smog being created and the VO by the VOCs that are being emitted into the air. The other thing that um, the report notes is that particulate matter is also created. And um, particulate matter is, think of it as sort of the soot that is created um, when there are various kinds of production, productive activities. And um, the size of these, of these particles make a difference in terms of how deep they can get into the lungs or, or whether they actually then can get absorbed into the bloodstream. And so the, we've seen a very low, uh, small sizes, um, particulate matter 2.5, as well as larger sizes 10, which uh, 10 becomes an irritant to the lung, these are largest sizes, and 2.5 are small enough they get deep into the lungs and actually get absorbed into the body. So they, those chemicals start circulating in our blood. Um, the, this data is from a, a study, this is not from the CCST, but rather from a peer-reviewed study that was uh, done by Theo Colborn and her colleagues uh, a year or two ago. And they reviewed 353 chemicals that were commonly used um, from 944 chemicals that they, uh, that they had a list of, of uh, fracking fluids. And and one of the things they discovered is that 75%, three quarters of the chemicals were irritants to the skin, eye, and respiratory tract and could create um, uh, GI problems or, or problems with our gut, essentially. 40 to 50% of the chemicals were neurotoxic. These, these had the potential to cause damage to our brain and nervous system, as well as to our immune system, our cardiovascular system, and our kidneys. 37% um, operated on a different mechanism and can be endocrine disrupting chemicals. And our endocrine systems essentially are sort of the 
the orchestra director for our body. And so when those start getting mucked about with, we can have changes in everything from our learning capacity, our language skills, our moods, our sexual performance. I mean, just a wide array of things can happen. Um, and 25% uh, percent of them were either known or suspected carcinogens or mutagenic, meaning that they could cause uh, birth defects. The acute effects that we are seeing that have been recorded in other parts of the country, and I say that specifically because we are not tracking acute uh, health effects that might be associated with uh, gas and oil extraction in California right now. We have, no, we have no mechanism that is in place for us to do that. But what we've seen where they are tracking it elsewhere is that um, there may be nausea and vomiting, nosebleeds, which are particularly common in children, and then flu-like symptoms. So think about this. If you've got flu-like symptoms and you go to the doctor or nurse practitioner, the first thing they're not going to think of is, oh, this is associated with oil and gas extraction. So if we don't have a process by which we're collecting the data and then beginning to look at these signs and symptoms as they may relate to the proximity of wellheads, then we're going to just think probably they're flu-like they're flu symptoms and we won't be putting the two and two together. Um, headaches is another, uh, is another symptom commonly seen. So this is a study, uh, and we do have very few, but this study is a really compelling one. So when babies are born, uh, the moment that they are born, we, we grade them on something called an APGAR score. And then five minutes later, we grade them again. Because sometimes babies may perk up, maybe they had a mucus plug or something in their nose and couldn't breathe right away, and we get rid of that and they're fine. But what we found is that those babies who are born to mothers within a mile and a half of a wellhead wind up having lower APGAR scores, both at the moment of birth and then five minutes later. And so what APGAR stands for, A, for appearance. You want a baby that's nice and pink. You don't want a blue baby. Their pulse rate should be appropriate for a newborn. When you, when you pinch them very lightly, you should get a grimace response. Um, that shows their reflex capacity. Um, they should have muscle tone. They should not be a floppy baby. They should, their arms and their legs should have tone, and they should be breathing at an appropriate rate. But those children who have been born, uh, statistically speaking, those children who are born closer to a wellhead or to a mom who's lived closer to a wellhead have lower APGAR scores. And lower APGAR scores are predictive to, um, to problems that that baby may have later down the line. So um, one of the things that uh, where we, once again, the, one of the few studies that we do have shows that also when people are living closer to frac sites, they are winding up having more admissions to hospitals, particularly for cardiovascular diseases. In California, we are also doing, as Holland said, acidizing. Um, sometimes under low pressure, sometimes under high pressure. And the hydrochloric acid that is being used can sometimes be at very high, extremely high um, solution levels. And this can cause, this can burn the lungs uh, and it actually destroy lung tissue when you breathe in hydrochloric or hydrochloric acid at those levels. But it also ha can create a range of other health problems as well. So I mentioned uh, that we also see uh, higher levels of ground level ozone, which is the bad ozone. And if people have asthma, this is particularly problematic and can really increase the risk of having asthma attacks. For people, particularly older people and particularly for older smokers who have chronic lung disease, ozone level is very irritating. And overall, um, chronic exposures to ozone can create premature aging of the lungs. Uh, other things, uh, and I'm going to just reiterate quickly um, uh, that Holland mentioned, we see blowout, blowouts um, or gas explosions. Those are going to create health and safety issues for the workers and any community that's nearby. And I think the other things Holland covered in his presentation.
The other things that he didn't cover and that we're seeing the public health and social services uh, communities are seeing in areas where there's a big influx of new frac workers who are almost uh, always men uh, and often they come alone without their, their partners or families. We've seen increased um, uh, drinking while driving, arrest, increased sexually transmitted diseases which are reportable diseases to um, local and state health departments, increased use of social services, and because housing stock um, uh, may begin to change as frac workers need to come in and compete with local residents for housing. Um, in other parts of the country, we've seen seniors and other vulnerable populations displaced. Holland talked about setbacks. I, I think it's really curious that uh, in, the, um, in the CCST, the recommendation and the language is called uh, calls for science-based setbacks, and yet we are not producing the science in our state right now. We haven't given the state health department any kind of mandate to do the science, nor a budget to do that. None of the other agencies are engaged in creating the science, so without the science for us to create a science-based setback requirements, we're not likely to see this in the near future. Um, in some places, there's also uh, been established fracker housing. This is for the frac workers. They sometimes call them man camps in North Dakota. And um, these are places where you've got concentrated um, new uh, residents that are frac workers that are not community members. They're kind of imported. Um, I don't know whether Holland mentioned this, but basically the gas and oil industry is uh, exempt from our Clean Air Act, from our clean water regulations. And so the reason, if anybody was wondering why we don't have information that we very well would have if this was any other kind of industry, is because um, they have been exempted. And that's been at a federal level, and it's been hard, if not impossible, to change at state levels. Uh, this is a, just a photo I took from, uh, from a plane uh, showing what some of the frac sites look like from, from the air. Next slide. Um, I think the next slide is just one that's a little closer to the ground. You can see uh, these tortuous kinds of roads um, that have sort of destroyed the landscape um, and is destroying numbers of communities. So um, one of the other quotes uh, is that public health is quote unquote, playing catch up with the stimulation enabled oil and gas development, and then particularly in California. I think this is, this is uh, an incredible statement. We don't have any, once again, any studies that we can actually catch up with. And until um, those studies are, are really expedited and in place, we're, we won't be able to catch up. And um, the oil and gas industry is just going to be going on as it has been. So with that, I think I'm going to end my part, and hopefully I will have a little time for questions and answers. Thanks, Barb. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Barb. Can folks hear me? This is Annie. I can hear you, Annie. Great. Wonderful. So a few questions have come in. Uh, the first, maybe we can get some housekeeping out of the way, uh, is whether these PowerPoints that we saw are going to be available after the webinar, um, and maybe I would add on to that question whether the whole recording will be available. I'll let Sue answer. Yeah, we will be um, making the recording available, and then um, I will work with both Holland and Barb to um, get their presentations up on probably the CEH website, and we'll figure out um, if other folks want to host having them, or we can send them out um, if you email us. OK, great. Um, I, we also had a question come in about lung cancer. Maybe, Barb, if this is something that you want to take, it says, Lung cancer in non-smokers is sharply increasing in several registries as reported at the recent 
16th World Conference on Lung Cancer. Notably, never smokers with lung cancer tend to be younger and women. Uh, you've described a number of carcinogens associated with fracking, including radioactive waste, silica, chemical carcinogens. Perhaps we should be looking at lung cancer trends in California more closely and spatial distributions of patterns. Do you have thoughts, Barb? Oh, sure, and, and that's a very good observation, whoever um, put that question in. Um, I think that absolutely we should be looking at this. We should be looking at myriad things that we're not looking at right now. Um, uh, one of the things to note about cancer, though, is there's generally a latency period, and, um, and that's a, a little bit of a harder one, um, especially given we're such a mobile uh, population generally. But absolutely, we should be uh, looking at our cancer registry, looking at trends, uh, not just from... Uh, from lung cancer, but from all cancers, and uh, and geocoding, uh, looking at them from a geographic perspective. So where are we seeing these rises? Um, and and so this is some of the science that I I think we should be engaged in and really pushing for. Um, we should be asking our local health officers um, to ask the state health department to be looking at this. We should be asking the state health department directly. We should be asking Governor Brown to be asking his state health department to be doing these studies um, immediately. Great. Uh, thanks. I've got another question here for Holland, um, which is a great question, which is how has Dogger reacted to this report? So, Holland, I'll let you take that, and maybe you can explain uh, the Dogger acronym for anyone who has not heard it before. Sure. Uh, Dogger is the Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources. They have the, they're housed in the Department of Conservation and have primary responsibility over the uh, oil and gas industry. Um, you know, I, uh, I haven't heard anything in particular uh, as a reaction to the CCST report. Um, originally, when uh, the schedule was lined up such that the um, science on uh, environmental harms was due out before the uh, before Dogger drafted its regulations, um, they intimated that they'd take a look at the report, they would base their regulations on the science, um, but the order got flipped. Uh, the scientific findings got delayed. Uh, Dogger went ahead with their regulations without um, being guided by uh, the health impacts or the science behind fracking. We now have in place regulations that um, ignore these findings or haven't had a chance to incorporate them. Uh, so, uh, you know, going forward, I think we uh, really need to make clear that you've told us before that we should wait for the science. Now the science is in. You've had a chance to review all the literature that's out there. Uh, many of the same studies have been examined by uh, health professionals in New York, and they came to the conclusion that uh, fracking was an unacceptable risk to the public, and it seems to me that uh, looking at the, the studies that were outlined in the independent uh, study here, that we should come to the same conclusion here in California. Can I also, can I also just share, Annie, that um, the American Nurses Association has called for a moratorium of fracking nationwide because nurses uh, looked at the science, and this was even several years ago, and said, you know, this really looks like it's a problem. We should just stop doing it. Indeed. Thank you for adding that. Uh, another great meaty question has come in. This one, uh, I'll, I'll let either Holland or Barb take a stab at. It says, Governor Brown, says it's appropriate to produce some of our oil needs in this state because if we import from South America or the Middle East, climate impacts are worse in terms of transportation and environmental protections are worse there. Uh, do we have a, a response 
Uh, I'll take a stab at it, Barb, you can uh, chime in if you'd like. Um, so the, the CCST report does um, examine the greenhouse gas emissions uh, from fracking and uh, came, came to the conclusion, uh, Annie, that, that you just restated that if we stop fracking in California, it would result in perhaps higher greenhouse gas emissions because we'd have to get our oil from uh, places that are further away. So there you add in the transportation costs uh, and perhaps a, a greater uh, carbon footprint um, if it's produced in a place that doesn't have the same uh, environmental laws that we have in the United States and in California. Um, you know, I, my take on that is that it's, it's based on a set of uh, presumptions that uh, don't necessarily hold true. So um, if, we, if we keep fracking in California, it's not like it would displace um, foreign oil production. That oil production would probably uh, continue regardless, and uh, adding oil to the global market would only uh, lower prices and make it more available. Um, second, it assumes that our demand for oil in California will stay constant going forward, uh, and that's uh, simply not the case. It can't be the case if we want to seriously tackle climate change, and uh, Governor Brown has uh, made clear that we need to reduce our uh, demand for oil going forward by as much as, as 50 percent. Uh, so, you know, the, the set of circumstances under which that would be true, I don't think necessarily hold. Right. Any other thoughts, Barb? Well, I just think that uh, for those of us who are uh, advocating for a, a motor moratorium on, on fracking and other of these extraction processes, we have to at the same time be calling for an acceleration of uh, renewables and the support, the various mechanisms that would support that acceleration. I think we have to be doing both um, because that's what's going to get us to where we need to be. Here, here. So I, I think we have time for one more question. And I think a good question to close us out is um, basically, so, so what happens now? Now that the CCSC report came out, there are a number of recommendations listed. What are the next steps? And are there other laws or any, any policy that we should look forward to? Well, uh, I think the, the report makes uh, a number of um, very useful recommendations, um, some concrete steps that the state can take to uh, address some of the worst problems with uh, oil and gas. Um, so the, the setback requirement, um, Barb mentioned that we don't have uh, science-based studies in California in particular, but there are studies uh, that exist in other states, uh, some of them she mentioned, where there are significant health impacts at half mile, a mile and a half, two miles. Um, so we should be looking at those studies and incorporating them uh, into our, our state regulations, um, phasing out percolation pits and uh, uh, shallow fracking near groundwater. Uh, I think those are all no-brainers, and we should uh, call on our state officials to, to implement those right away. But the broader picture is that, um, uh, like Barb mentioned, the, the CCST report really is saying that uh, there are health and environmental risks that are common to all oil and gas activity. Uh, it is one big dangerous process, and uh, you know, change is not going to happen overnight, uh, for sure. But I think that's uh, a reason to get started now and not to not to wait. So I think hey. also, also um, Annie, that I, I would really encourage folks to um, to make appointments to go and talk to Governor Brown's staff. 
I would encourage them to talk to uh, Karen Smith, who's the head of the health department. Um, we've gone, and I'm sure Holland has, or at least folks from his organization, met with the Dogger folks. Um, that doesn't seem to be a very fruitful visit, um, or, or at least it hasn't been historically. But I think that also meeting with your local legislators, and um, we would love to put together a tour of the uh, Bakersfield um, oil and gas fields the, um, with our other state legislators. So um, if any of the folks that are on the call would like to be engaged in helping to get them to come and just see and smell and feel what it is like in the communities that are really being uh, impacted, um, we think that that would really change a lot of minds, actually. Great. Thanks for that pitch, Barb. That's perfect. Uh, I think I'll turn this over to Sue to close us out. Okay, thanks, Annie. Um, yeah, we're just at the hour, so um, you know, thank you f to everyone for joining today and for the speakers. Um, we will see. I think we got to most people's questions, but if we didn't get to yours, we'll try to look through and see if we can um, follow up with you separately. And we will make the uh, presentation recordings and all that available, um, and we'll notify you when it is. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Okay.